The next in our series of international topics is resolved, unbalanced, sovereign African nations should have the right to disregard Geneva Conventions to combat international terrorist organizations. This one's mostly being debated by international schools in South Korea, though there might be a couple other teams traveling in who this could be of interest to. Let's talk about the wording of the topic, then some of the arguments. So it starts with on balance, which is fairly standard for debate resolutions. On balance can mean all arguments considered. It can mean in the majority of cases. In this particular resolution, right to disregard is the part that modifies on balance. So we will come back to that later on. Sovereign African states is in the resolution. Not just African states, but sovereign African states. For this to be a distinction, we have to either consider how the Geneva Conventions interact with sovereignty, or consider what it would take to be counted as a non-sovereign African state. As it is, states is fairly interchangeable with nations here. A non-occupied, sorry, non-sovereign state might be like occupied Western Sahara, for instance, which is currently controlled by Morocco, but at the same time, generally speaking, sovereign isn't going to play too much of a role in this resolution as far as which countries get talked about, so much as it's there to fuel a fairly semantic pro-argument affirming the resolution by talking about if they are sovereign, then they should have this right. This is the kind of right that is key to sovereignty. Takes us to should. Again, should can be defined as either moral imperative rational self-interest, or reasonable prediction, depending on how you're talking here. Generally speaking, should indicating desirability or moral imperative is probably what both sides are going to clash most on on this topic, though there are certainly arguments that can come from each of the three definitions. I would avoid the last definition just because that tends to be a cheap shot that only works if the other team doesn't address it, but you should be aware that it is there. It says should have the right to disregard. This tilts the resolution a lot towards the pro side. It's not asking if they should disregard, it's asking if they should be able to. So pro does not need to defend that they are disregarded in the majority of cases. And this is how right to disregard modifies on balance. It's asking more along the lines of given that you can disregard these, is that enough? So a con side might give a lot of reasons why it is bad to disregard them. A pro side might give a bunch of reasons why it's good to be able to, even if you don't, because of sovereignty. And that, I think, kind of detracts from some of the clash of the round and kind of tilts the balance a little bit more towards pro. So disregard Geneva Conventions. Geneva Conventions is capitalized. We can assume it is the Geneva Conventions. They shouldn't be confused with the Geneva Protocol from 1925, which is more how you fight wars. The Geneva Conventions, unlike the Hague Conventions, are not about warfare itself. They're about people caught in the crosshairs, people caught in the middle of war. So 1949 was the first global attempt at a Geneva Convention. It added a fourth convention to the previous three. The conventions were in order first to deal with sick and wounded soldiers, second to deal with shipwrecked sailors, third to deal with prisoners of war, and fourth, and this is the one that came after 1945, after World War II, the first one that tried to really apply to non-European nations, also dealt with civilians in war zones. So it's worth noting that the majority of the Geneva Conventions were written in the context of non-territorial wars between European nation-states using wars to make political points without the goal of permanent occupation of the other country, and with regular uniformed armies who fought by the same rules as each other. A lot of this doesn't apply when we are talking about international terrorist organizations, whatever those are, we will get to that definition in just a moment. Continuing on Geneva Conventions, however, two protocols were added onto the convention in 1977, and the protocols are probably also part of the topic. One of them was for international armed conflicts and one for non-international armed conflicts. Technically, 
it's a second that's usually supposed to apply here, even if the organization itself is international in the resolution. They exempt mercenaries from the Geneva Protections, but there's a seven-part definition they have to meet all seven parts of, and international terrorist organizations aren't mercenaries under that definition. Yeah. A third protocol was added in 2005, but this protocol was mostly about uniforms and emblems for non-combatants, how you mark an unarmed medic, how it is a war crime to impersonate an unarmed medic, or to attack one. Around 15 African nations have signed since 2005, and 10 of those have not ratified yet. So, someone from the nation has signed, depending on how their government is set up and who their international representative is, but the legislative body of the country hasn't officially recognized it yet. So, that's how the Geneva Conventions interact here. Now, international terrorist organizations is an interesting concept. Does it mean an organization that has members from multiple countries? Does it mean an organization that wants to terrorize a country that it is not part of? The broader the definition of this, the more kinds of organizations you could be talking about. And generally speaking, you would think that broadening the resolution would seem to benefit Khan here because Pro would be defending this against a wider range of conflicts for a wider range of situations. The trouble is that broadening doesn't really help Khan because Pro is asking about the right to disregard, not whether it's actually going to be disregarded in all of these cases. That said, Pro can still do just fine with a fairly narrow definition where we are only talking about a couple niche organizations that pr pose fairly direct threats from international sponsors and are attacking across borders. These you will mostly see around Congo, around Sudan, around Sierra Leone, but to a lesser extent these days, when talking about Africa. If you're broadening the definition, then you could also be talking about Al-Qaeda affiliates in Ethiopia, in Somalia, in Mauritania, and in Mali. In either case, what an international terrorist organization is, is up for debate, but probably doesn't matter too much. There are some things that definitely count if anything counts. If nothing counts, you need a new definition. If anything counts, these count. And if these count, it becomes a question of should we have the option or not? Should we have this right or not? So, moving on from that. The resolution is still on balance. There is more clash when pro defense actually exercising the right rather than having it in the abstract, but it does redefine on balance away from majority of cases. When we're talking about sovereignty, sovereignty might be binary or it might be a spectrum. If it is binary, if you're either sovereign or you're not sovereign, it's not a question of how much sovereignty you have, then does that really just rule out Western Sahara, some parts of Yemen or Somalia? Does it rely on recognition by the UN? If sovereignty is a spectrum, why does the word sovereignty matter in the resolution? So, for instance, you can run into states like Zimbabwe and South Africa who are arguing that you don't have sovereignty if you ratify these, so the nations that do follow them aren't really truly sovereign, and at that point we shouldn't be talking about them. The nations who should have the right to disregard them are the nations who haven't agreed to follow them in the first place, and it's kind of hard for you to prove on con that people who haven't signed a treaty should not have the right to disregard that treaty. So again, no single phrase in this resolution is a problem on its own, but the way that they interact with each other makes life very difficult for con teams. Which is interesting because Khan seems to have the intuitively stronger position of war crimes are bad, torture is bad, private mercenaries are bad, we shouldn't fight terrorism with terrorism. And in general, that can be an argument that works more, the more decontextualized it is from these specific wars. What Pro wants to do is focus more on the unique circumstances here that these are rules that the majority of African nations have not fully ratified, 
that were imposed by the same people who colonized Africa in a way that set up a lot of these conflicts with international terrorist organizations in the first place, and that their opponents will not play by. There is another big question behind this resolution that is worth going into, but that isn't explicitly mentioned. And normally I say that when you're talking about a topic that doesn't mention the U.S., it's bad to try to make a topic about the United States. I think that this question kind of forces a debate about the United States' relationship with the Geneva Conventions in it. Specifically, did the United States violate the Geneva Conventions during its war on terror, in particular between 2002 and 2010? And this becomes interesting because the United States' argument is that they did not disregard the Geneva Conventions. The Geneva Conventions do not apply against international terrorist organizations. If that is true, then PRO does not need the right to disregard these conventions. The only reason to disregard these conventions would be to target your own civilians in the crosshairs. And... At that point, if your civilians are caught in the middle, that creates much weaker pro-ground. Pro's argument is that, yes, the U.S. is disregarding the Geneva Conventions. It is doing so for the same reasons that should justify sovereign African states to do the same, and that if other countries are able to disregard them, to combat international terrorist organizations, these countries where the attacks are actually happening at home, where the organizations do actually stand a chance of winning, where it is actually a matter of life and death for the everyday civilian population, they should be able to not play by stricter rules than their adversaries who have an actual chance of winning are playing by. So even though the topic is not about the United States in the slightest, your team's answer to the question of whether United States actions with drones, with extraordinary rendition, with Guantanamo, with torture, with black sites, do these disregard Geneva Conventions? Or do your Geneva Conventions not apply in that kind of conflict with an international terrorist organization in the first place? This is another argument that makes it tricky for Khan because if they push too hard on this argument, then it puts them in a position where they've actually made it so that you don't have to disregard them in the first place at all. I think that Khan wants to agree that that doesn't count as disregarding under that definition if Pro makes that argument. I don't think Khan wants to bring the argument up in the first place themselves, but I do think that that's a place that Pro can overextend if Khan lets them. And if they do, Khan should let them. Khan wants the debate to be about the civilian population. Pro wants the debate to be about various terrorist leaders who aren't playing by these rules anyway, who will dress their soldiers as civilians or as medics, who will torture for information, who will attack non-military targets, and who will take advantage of anybody else's willingness to play by rules that they don't. Khan wants to blur the lines. Khan wants to say, the civilians who disagree with the current ruling party are the ones who are actually going to be targeted by this. That it's not really a case of, this is a legitimate government, and this is a terrorist organization in every single African nation. In many, it's just that one opposition party is labeled as terrorists, and one dominant terrorist group is labeled as the recognized government, and that this can vary state by state. At that point, the more the line is blurred, the less you can actually see why disregarding would be good for pro. So Khan wants to make the argument that once you say they should have the right to disregard this, that right is going to be abused right now the only thing is actually separating in some countries the legitimate government from the terrorist opposition party 
is that they are willing to abide by these kinds of international agreements, that they are willing to refrain from risking crimes against humanity, and that by following these rules, they're actually going to put themselves ahead. That takes us to the last argument that I want to talk about on this topic, the question of does this help or hurt these sovereign African states in winning their conflicts, and does it matter? So, Pro can make the argument, and probably will make the argument, that it's more efficient to fight back against these groups when you have less regulations. Khan can either contest that by saying it doesn't matter, it's not about what's most efficient. If it was about what's most efficient, we'd just use weapons of mass destruction, but obviously we care about international law to some extent. Khan can also say that, no, it's not actually more efficient. And this is one place that Khan has two ways to win and Pro only has one. So this is an area of the resolution that Khan can make some ground back on. Khan can say that, be that being dependent on African Union aid, on UN aid, on other foreign aid is crucial in a lot of these circumstances, and you don't get that when you violate international law. So whether or not you do actually disregard them, saying we have the right to disregard them, we think that these international treaties don't apply to us, we don't care about crimes against humanity, deters other countries from coming to your aid. And if you're combating an international terrorist organization, then there is part of that organization that has a presence somewhere else that you cannot fight on your own, and you need international help to fight. At that point, the Khan side can say that we actually are able to do this better when we follow the Geneva Conventions, when we don't even say we have the ability to disregard them, but where we take a strong commitment and say we shall not disregard these. At that point, you can win on either that efficiency is on your side or that efficiency doesn't matter. The second thing about this is just perception within the country. Regardless of perceptions of the ICC, the Geneva Conventions, international law at large among African leaders, a lot of civilians still see people being willing to obey these kinds of laws as a good thing even if they don't know where they come from in the first place, or the history of Napoleonic warfare that led to early Geneva Conventions. At that point, Khan can make the argument that if you want to win hearts and minds, if you want to win a counter aid surgery kind of situation, if you want to establish yourself as a legitimate government to your people, so they stop hiding terrorists, stop funding terrorists, stop joining terrorists, then you need to actually go ahead and show that you have a stronger commitment to human rights than your opponents, even if it costs you militarily, even if it costs you in terms of gathered intelligence. Now, Pro can say that it's not really about your own population, it's not about rebels, International terrorist organizations means the terrorists are coming from elsewhere, but it probably doesn't mean that all of them are coming from elsewhere. It means that many of them are. It means that there is some source of funding elsewhere, some base elsewhere maybe, but at the same time, international terrorist organizations only really pose a threat and only really succeed when they're getting some kind of sympathy, some kind of information, some kind of shelter from someone in the country, and making them less sympathetic and yourself more sympathetic can be crucial to stopping them. Obviously, this is a topic of dueling empirical studies. Both sides are going to talk about situations where an African nation, or even a non-African nation, tried both approaches. Whether being restrained by the Geneva Conventions hurt them. Whether the flexibility helped. Whether terrorist attacks were stopped by extra legal actions according to international law whether war crimes boosted terrorist groups in the first place. And as each of the examples come up, each side is going to be asking, well, how does this example apply to African conflicts at large? How does it apply on balance? My example is the rule, your example is the exception. Overall, both sides are going to want to draw from recent conflicts when they can. Both sides are ideally going to going to want to be talking about conflicts that do involve terrorist organizations when possible, and talk about countries who have, if not signed on to the 2005 protocol to the Geneva Convention, at least recognize the ICC.
part of what makes this topic timely is because South Africa has announced their intentions to withdraw from the ICC because of sovereignty concerns. Overall, if you have the option on this topic, I think that Pro has more flexibility in arguments and benefits more from more nuance of the region. I think that Khan isn't significantly weaker than Pro, but is more predictable in what kinds of arguments it can make and is more limited in what kind of responses it can make. There aren't really any definitions that, if defined aggressively, give Khan a huge advantage, but there are definitions that if they let Pro define them, they will lose the debate. So keep that in mind when selecting sides, keep that in mind when framing arguments. If you have any other questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'd be glad to talk about specific contentions. If there's ones in particular people want to run specific countries, examples of conflicts, if there's any of those that people want to talk about. Other than that, best of luck on the topic. Let me know if there's anything else on it I can do for you. Enjoy your rounds this November and December.